Hi, uh, my name is Jason Merlo. I'm a PhD student from Michigan State University in the uh, Delta Research Group advised by um, Dr. Jeffrey Nanzer. And I'm going to be discussing some of the work that we've been working on on uh, high accuracy wireless timing synchronization using uh, software defined radios. Um, so, just to uh, get started, we'll talk about some of the motivation and applications. Um, some of these may sound a little familiar. And uh, we'll talk about the synchronization technique that we've um, been uh, implementing. And we'll give an overview of the software implementation and a short demo of the software itself and go through some experimental uh, results of it actually being used in an application outdoors. So um, just to kind of uh, give a, a brief motivation of why we're doing this. So um, the motivation that we're looking towards is distributed, uh, uh, distributed coherent antenna networks. Um, so the idea behind that is just to have, you know, a distributed array of antenna elements which are coordinated together um, wirelessly so they can be you know, uh, sp spatially moved around and operate as if they're one large uh, antenna element. So uh, some of the applications that you can achieve if you are able to uh, achieve this type of synchronization uh, are, for instance, like in um, next generation satellite cellular networks. Uh, commonly, these employ very large, um, you know, antenna arrays that uh, are costly to deploy and um, are difficult to repair once they're once they're on orbit. So, if you were able to achieve this uh, synchronization, you could deploy this in an array of small cube satellites, which could be deployed over, you know, say multiple launches. Um, and you know, as uh, if an element fails or as it degrades over time, or you need to upgrade things, these can be um, kind of gracefully decay and be replaced uh, as well. Um, and since these all bring, of course, their own uh, power supplies as well, um, you know, the thermal management becomes a little bit easier as well since uh, you don't need to um, operate on such a uh, you know, large high power um, antenna. Some of the other applications, um, for instance, in precision agriculture and sensing, so if you had, uh, you want to do like a passive radiometry, do soil moisture sensing, uh, you could use an array of, uh, of um, like a, a swarm of drones that are coordinated together coherently, or you could do uh, also um, precision crop yield estimation as well uh, in, a, in a radar type operation. Um, distributed V to X sensing, if you had uh, autonomous vehicles coordinated together, you could use that to perform radar operations, increase your spatial diversity, uh, and improve the probability of detection, in this case of a pedestrian. And finally, just to kind of drive the point home, um, say you have a, a rover on the surface of Mars that has uh, a video link, for instance, or high bandwidth link that it needs to send back to Earth. Um, typically, you'd have some sort of low gain antenna on there uh, that could broadcast back to an array of CubeSats uh, that was deployed with the, the same mission, and that could then beam form a high gain, high bandwidth link back to Earth uh, to stream that data. So of course, uh, in order to accomplish this, we need to make sure that the uh, array itself is um, synchronized, and that would be in time, phase, and frequency. Uh, if our timing's um, misaligned between the platforms, that's going to limit the um, total coherent gain that we can get to the uh, destination location. So in this case, we're showing a BPSK signal um, that's shifted by maybe half of a bit cycle. Um, you're going to get coherent nulling for half of that bit cycle, and you're effectively going to get uh, you know, only a fraction of your um, coherent gain at the target, which obviously is not the goal when you're, when you're uh, coordinating this. Um, and that you know, just scales with larger arrays. Uh, same for phase alignment. You need to make sure that you know accurately where the position of each element in your array is at all times so that when you beam steer into a certain direction, you're not losing um, power at that uh, target location. Um, and then finally, if you're you know, synchronized in frequency or syntonized, um, then you're going to get a beat frequency at the destination location uh, as well. So sometimes you'll be coherently uh, adding, and sometimes you'll be nulling yourself, um, which is, is no good either. So all three of these need to be accomplished. Uh, this work specifically is focusing on the timing synchronization, since um, that's a kind of a, a, a convergent problem. So uh, I'll, I'll be discussing the, the timing synchronization part. Uh, and then for our final applications, we'll also be going over a kind of an adjunct frequency synchronization syn circuit that we've used as well uh, in conjunction with this to perform fully wireless operations. Um, so the synchronization technique, uh, so I guess um, to get started, we talk, uh, you can just uh, model the, um, the time at each one of these antenna nodes, uh, in this case, software-defined radios, just simply as a function of the global true time, small t, uh, plus some uh, time-varying offset, we call that um, delta sub n of t at each node n, and some um, zero mean uh, noise term as well. 
So our goal is to estimate the time offset at any one of these nodes relative to, um, in this case, we choose some arbitrary node to be the primary node, node zero. Uh, we want to determine that timing offset to compensate for it. Um, so to do this, we use a two-way time synchronization exchange. Uh, and this just depends on the link itself being reciprocal during the synchronization epoch. Uh, the synchronization epoch is the amount of time uh, or the duration that it takes from the first node to send a uh, time delay estimation pulse, the second node to receive it, uh, and then the nodes to transmit back to the, uh, to the initiating node. So this kind of back and forth exchange. Um, so the link needs to be uh, reciprocal and that kind of implies that it's quasi-static. Uh, so these time uh, estimation pulses are you know, on the order of microseconds, so it um, generally is not super, uh, you know, super limiting unless you're moving you know, very, very fast, but generally this isn't a very uh, limiting assumption. Um, so in then order to determine the uh, timing skew estimation, uh, you just take the apparent time of flight in either direction. So the apparent time of flight would be the um, time that the initiating node, so if you look at the orange line, for instance, the time that that node timestamps the transmitted pulse, and the uh, time that the receiving node receives it on its local clock. Uh, you take the, the difference of those, um, and you do the same thing for the reverse. Uh, take the difference of those apparent timestamps. You get the apparent time delays, or the local timestamps, sorry. You get the apparent time delays, uh, subtract them, and divide that by two. That is our estimate of the time difference between the platforms. Um, similar way, uh, if you just average these apparent time of flights, you can get the uh, internode um, time of flight and uh, multiply by your propagation constant, you're gonna get the, um, the, or the speed, of, yeah, speed of light in the medium, you're gonna get the distance between platforms as well. Um, so in order to do this, of course, it needs the accuracy with which you can uh, determine the um, time estimates is gonna limit how well you can synchronize between the platforms. So uh, we focused on the waveform design here specifically for um, what waveform we want to use when we're performing this time estimate. Um, so if you look at the lower bound on time delay estimation, it's uh, really bounded by the, um, the um, signal to noise ratio. So the inverse of the signal to noise ratio, which in most practical systems, you've already, uh, that's already optimized, so you want to have a high SNR. Uh, and then also the um, reciprocal of the mean squared bandwidth of the signal. And so really, um, on the right-hand side here, we're showing a plot of the mean squared bandwidth of a signal um, based on where the energy is distributed in that. So in the lower right-hand corner, we're showing for a linear frequency modulated waveform, um, which is you know, commonly used in uh, radar, radar uh, um, for time delay estimation. Uh, however, if you move all of that energy towards the ends of the spectrum, you actually get a higher um, accuracy. So uh, in this case, you have a two-tone um, waveform uh, and that's shown in the upper left-hand corner, so with all the power uh, separated to the ends of that spectrum there. Um, kind of more importantly though, this is a much simpler waveform to generate. So if you have, say, a two-channel SDR, you can actually split that up onto those two channels and just generate uh, those two narrow band um, pulses, and you can get much wider tone separations by tuning those channels to different carrier frequencies, which, of course, you can't really do if you have a continuous bandwidth signal such as uh, an LFM. So, um, then uh, moving on to how we actually estimate this time delay. So we use a match filter here, and a uh, match filter is just the um, convolution of the received signal uh, with the time-reversed complex conjugate of the transmitted signal. That can be efficiently accomplished in the um, frequency domain as well. So um, that's typically how we would do it for, for larger signals. So effectively what this looks like for a two-tone waveform is shown on the right. We have um, approximately a cosine squared waveform being windowed by a uh, triangular function. If you look at the um, peak of that, that's gonna be discretized by the sampling rate of your platform. So in our experiments, we've used uh, Edis X310 SDRs. So those are sampled at 200 mega samples per second. So five nanosecond discretization. Uh, if we wanna get down to picosecond level, we still have a lot of refining to do uh, in order to um, get down to that level. So um, the next thing we, we look to do is uh, refine that further. And so to do that, we use a technique called quadratic least squares um, fitting. This is commonly employed, again, in uh, radar systems to refine the, the echoes of um, typically a, an LFM scatter, but to refine it down to a, uh, a single point. It's been used for, for quite some time. So essentially, you take the peak of your, your match filter output and you um, just uh, um, fit a, a, a parabola between that peak and the two adjacent points. 
Uh, and then there is a way to solve for that in, the, in a closed form in order to pick the uh, direct peak of that parabola, uh, shown here on the slide. Um, and so just to kind of visually uh, represent that, as you fractionally move between two delay bins uh, in this animation on the right we're going to show here, uh, the true time delay is the dashed red line. The dashed blue line is the peak of the match filter output. And um, you can just kind of follow the peak of the uh, quadratic least squares interpolation uh, and see that it you know, follows quite closely. Um, and so using this computational efficient technique, that gets us pretty close to, to what we're looking for um, in terms of refinement. Um, of course, if you uh, we're following closely as well. You can perform some interpolation just by zero padding in the frequency domain as well uh, in the match filter step, um, and that can improve uh, things as well. Um, so finally, uh, we perform a uh, refinement on, on top of this as well. So because the parabola is not a perfect fit for um, the, the matched filter output, um, there is still some residual bias left over, and this is a function just of the, um, the waveform parameters and the sampling rate. So we can uh, correct for this using uh, a lookup table ahead of time, since we know uh, ahead of time what the sampling rate and waveform parameters were. Um, so, uh, yeah. So uh, now to kind of discuss a bit of the uh, software that we've implemented in GNU Radio uh, for this project. So we had some um, challenges that we wanted to address when we, start, uh, when we started out to uh, employ this in software-defined radios. We wanted to make sure that uh, this could be run on you know, relatively reasonable computing hardware. We didn't want to have to build you know, you know, workstation, desktops, gaming computers in order to, to be able to run this. So um, one of the uh, things we looked for uh, was to use a bursty transmission scheme. So TDMA, and we just use uh, short bursts of, um, uh, of the, the sampling on the SDRs in order to accomplish this. Uh, so to do that then, we also wanted to be able to manage our latency. Uh, in, in, a, in an easy way. So we um, looked to using just a PDU-based uh, graph and sending uh, messages around rather than using the, the streaming-based um, uh, format. And then, um, so finally, the um, kind of between each of the blocks, we also um, kind of developed our own way of uh, time aligning everything, all of the, uh, the samples. So initially, we created a wide PDU, which was uh, our protocol data unit, wide protocol data unit. Um, and that ended up not working so well, since it doesn't work nicely with the blocks that already exist out there. So we are kind of migrating towards uh, just sending lists of uh, PDUs as well to more nicely um, use the, uh, the great set of uh, PDU-based processing blocks that have uh, been in introduced recently in GNU Radio. Um, and then some of the guiding principles. Uh, so we wanted to um, focus on code reusability, since we are a research group. So. Um, we created a uh, separate package um, yeah, del uh, called the Delta Python package, where we uh, do most of our um, processing, and that allows us to use the same software for um, simulations outside of GNU Radio, and uh, as well as offline data processing that we may be doing as well. And um, then our speed of implementation and uh, ability to iterate, of course, uh, we also um, use uh, Python for, for that as well. Uh, and then if we need to, we uh, will implement things in C++. Uh, although thus far, we, we haven't run into many issues where uh, that hasn't worked for us since it is mostly um, vectorized NumPy operations uh, in, in, in the code. Um, so yeah, so just to kind of uh, reiterate the um, time delay estimation process, we generate our waveform samples uh, to begin with on the primary node. We uh, transmit those in a TDMA window. Um, of course, these windows aren't going to align per perfectly because the, the clocks on the different platforms will be slightly offset. Um, and we have our, our pulses. Uh, in this case, we've been using 10 microsecond pulses. So we know the clock tick that our samples are sent at uh, with pretty high accuracy. Uh, we want to estimate the receive samples. So um, on the receive side, we uh, perform the match filter, the peak finding, quadratic least squares estimation. Uh, and then after that uh, refinement process, we get uh, another timestamp. So we have the two timestamps uh, in one direction, and we just repeat the same process in the other direction to get the other two timestamps. From those four timestamps, we can determine uh, with fairly uh, high accuracy what the timing offsets between the platforms are. So um, just to look to how this actually is employed in GNU Radio, uh, I've tried to color code the uh, virtual sources and syncs to, to be able to follow, follow the, where this is going. Um, but I'll, I'll discuss kind of uh, some of the, the blocks in here that are uh, really doing the, the grunt work here. So we start with our um, waveform generation block. This just generates the uh, PDU samples for each channel, uh, the samples which are stored in the PDUs uh, for each of the channels that are to be sent to the SDR. Um, 
it can take some parameters on the input uh, to generate those waveforms. And uh, on the output, uh, we have the, uh, the, um, the, the samples in PDU form, uh, so a list of PDUs for each channel, and um, a dictionary which describes that waveform as well. And that is um, just used for the matched filter block. So we actually have a reference of the waveform we transmitted. So next, we um, developed our own uh, usurp sync burst block. And this is basically just to take in those uh, PDU samples and perform a timed transmission. Um, I know that this is uh, probably possible to do using the, the streaming API, and that's uh, something that we're, we're looking into with the, uh, the built-in block. But this was uh, a design choice we made early on to, to get uh, off the ground quickly. Um, but uh, essentially, this works in lockstep. It transmits, the, uh, transmits and receives at the same time on the same channels. So we're going to get the same number of samples out that we, that we put in. Uh, and it comes out in a PDU, uh, list of PDU format as well. And then uh, that goes into our match filter block, where we perform our uh, match filtering based on the reference waveform that we transmitted from the WaveGen block. So we can get those time delay estimates. And um, we perform our quadratic least squares interpolation and uh, any um, correction that we need to make on that. And uh, then it goes into our time sync controller, which essentially just performs that uh, two-way time transfer logic where we um, you know, fill matrices based on the side of the array and uh, determine the time offsets between the platforms in the array. Um, so this uh, kind of version of the flow graph is, uh, I'll say, a monolithic uh, flow graph. So this is all controlled by um, one computing node in this, in this version here. Uh, so all the SDRs are connected to it. So essentially, this would actually run around this loop twice in order to perform that two-way time exchange um, for two nodes. Um, and uh, we've been working on the distributed version of this uh, code as well. So um, I'll just give a quick demonstration of this, uh, this running here. So this is in our lab where we have the software-defined radios. They're on two carts. Uh, in orange here, uh, underneath the carts, we have the X310 SDRs. Uh, and then we have just a regular desktop computer, um, uh, which is coordinating those. So we have a coordination uh, you know, fiber ethernet connected to both of those SDRs. And then on the top, we have uh, the time transfer antennas. In this demonstration, uh, we have the frequency uh, connected between the two SDRs, frequency references. Uh, in the following demonstration, uh, we'll show it fully wireless. But this is just a, a quick demonstration of the software. In the upper right-hand corner, we'll just show the um, SNR estimates. This is a pretty high SNR. Um, we have the matched filter outputs being shown in the middle here. Uh, and then at the bottom, we just have the time domain uh, of the, um, the different waveforms that we're transmitting back and forth. And uh, shown in the upper right-hand corner in a second here, the uh, standard deviation of the timing corrections between the platform here is about four, four and a half picoseconds. Uh, and the total offset and timing between the platforms there is about 22.62 uh, nanoseconds. Um, so, this is, uh, I guess, moving on to more of an, an actual application of this outdoors. Uh, so we have a, um, some work that we recently did where we were performing some beam forming to a target location. We have the uh, similar t setup with the two uh, carts and uh, the SDRs in those carts. Um, in this case, we uh, added an addition. We have a signal generator, which generates the frequency reference for the whole system. So uh, the reference out of that is just disciplining the local oscillator on the, um, the software-defined radio on the primary cart. Uh, we also uh, transmit that at a carrier of 4.3 gigahertz over to a two-tone frequency locking circuit. So um, the two tones that are being generated are 10 megahertz apart. We just self-mix that with itself, uh, put that through a low-pass filter, and we're able to get uh, 10 megahertz fundamental frequency out of that to discipline the local oscillator on the uh, other cart, secondary cart. Um, and then uh, the time transfer is happening on the primary channel of the SDRs, and then we perform a beamforming operation to a downrange target uh, on the uh, secondary channel. So um, the way this, uh, this works, initially, we had uh, a GNSS receivers uh, to perform just a single pulse uh, to roughly align the systems on the order of tens of nanoseconds uh, to make sure that those TDMA windows align when we do our uh, bursty trans uh, transmission to uh, synchronize the system. So once we do that one time at startup, we perform the two-way time transfer exchange, get down to the residual picosecond level of synchronization. Uh, we transmit the beamforming pulses uh, to the oscilloscope, in this case, target location. Uh, and at, at the oscilloscope, we estimate the um, time difference of arrival of the two waveforms, as well as the phase difference of arrival, so that we can uh, perform uh, um, performance metrics. 
Um, and in this case, we also performed a calibration uh, on the very first pulse. We took those, uh, those pulses and used them as an alignment to make sure we are um, beamforming to uh, the target location. In some of our more recent works as well, we've demonstrated this um, with, the, with the nodes moving, so um, uh, not, you know, not just uh, calibrating to a static target location uh, as well. So uh, just uh, to keep, uh, um, to discuss how the, the performance evaluation occurred, we had uh, two, two different types of waveforms we transmitted. Um, and the first waveform were orthogonal LFM waveforms so that we could easily separate those out with a match filter at the oscilloscope, uh, an up chirp and a down chirp, one from each of the SDRs, followed by uh, a pulse train of continuous wave rectangular pulses. Uh, where the central pulse was overlining. So when these sum together, uh, we know how much power each of the two nodes was con contributing, and then we know what the uh, total sum of those uh, was. Uh, we can estimate the total sum of the power as well. Uh, and from that, we can determine what the coherent gain uh, of transmission is to make sure um, you know, they're actually operating coherently. So uh, this is just a picture of the outdoor setup we have. Um, so we performed two different experiments, one with a two meter separation, one with a five meter separation between the nodes. Uh, and we were beam forming at one gigahertz in this uh, experiment to a downrange target shown on the right, which is just an oscilloscope connected to uh, a, uh, an antenna. So um, this is the, uh, the results of our experiment. On the left-hand side are the, um, are the, um, absolute values of the, the measurement. So the top row, uh, sorry, the, uh, the absolute values of the measurement on the right-hand side is the standard deviation of the measurement. Uh, the top row is the self-reported uh, corrections the system is applying to, uh, the, um, to its local clock. The middle row is the um, timing offset of the time difference of arrival at the uh, oscilloscope of the beamforming pulses. And the bottom row is the phase difference of arrival of those beamforming pulses. So uh, in the middle here, we blanked out the frequency transfer circuit just to really demonstrate that the time synchronization is uh, actually uh, performing the corrections. And um, really kind of the takeaway from this is if you look at the beamforming time delay accuracy on the uh, middle row on the right column, uh, when we blank that out, uh, you can see that the time slips you know, about a microsecond for that period. However, the um, standard deviation of our beamforming waveforms is um, you know, really not impacted by that, uh, um, that loss of uh, timing or you know, frequency alignment between the, the, the platforms. So um, then to uh, show some, just a, a sample of the results from the um, coherent, uh, coherent pulses that we have here, um, all of the results showed coherent gain above 90% in these trials. Uh, so this is just a, a, you know, a representative sample that we just kind of picked to visually um, represent it. Uh, and just kind of see what the um, waveforms themselves look like when you uh, line them all up. So, um, take away from this, uh, based on some of our previous work, um, we've done some analyses on what these uh, timing standard deviations should be able to uh, should be able to achieve based on different modulation schemes, um, and as well as the phase stability based on our frequency transfer circuit, what the maximum supported carrier frequency should be. Um, so, based on those theoretical analysis, uh, we should be able to. Um, hopefully achieve uh, on the order of five, uh, four to five gigabits per second based on these uh, experiments uh, at carrier frequencies of, uh, you know, two gigahertz uh, roughly. So um, just to kind of wrap up and discuss the, the status of our, of our project and conclude, um, we're working on standardizing that uh, uh, communication between the blocks uh, to make sure that, um, you know, list, using lists of PDUs rather than um, some custom uh, type so that we can more easily use the existing PDU infrastructure in uh, GNU Radio. Um, working on adding, uh, or working on implementing that fully distributed comp compute model, and that's actually already been been done, and the testing is is underway. And currently, we uh, you know see the same level of performance. And uh, we're working on adding and improving the documentation of both the uh, Python module and the uh, GNU Radio blocks that we've been working on. Um, we plan to add some test cases for the continuous improvement uh, or continuous integration deployment of our uh, code. And we'd love to be able to uh, open source this in the future. Um, and so uh, finally, some of the uh, planned work that we're looking into is trying to also um, use the streaming interface for GNU Radio as well to um, be able to uh, utilize some of the more, um, some of the, the uh, existing streaming uh, um, uh, features of uh, uh, existing streaming block sets in GNU Radio as well, more easily with this with this code. 
Um, so I'd like to uh, thank you all for listening, thank our uh, project collaborators and sponsors, and open the uh, floor if there's any questions or uh, comments. I'd love to uh, discuss this. Any questions? Right behind you. Thanks for the nice talk. So my question is regarding the 10 microseconds that you have chosen. So based on what have you chosen this value? Um, so the estimation of uh, the, the, the time of arrival estimation um, is um, bounded by the post-process SNR. Um, so your, your pulse duration is going to Im improve that. So as that increases, you get you know, longer integration time. And we've just found that um, 10 microseconds is empirically a good value that we've uh, uh, and how many cycles what was the frequency uh, the clock local oscillator frequency um, I mean, how, how many pulses and how many uh, uh, like pulses do you actually transmit so this is um, happening uh, in, in in both of these uh, demonstrations it's synchronizing every 500 milliseconds every 500 milliseconds um, so one exchange every 500 milliseconds half a second Okay, and the, the one, one cycle itself, the 10 microseconds, how many pulses do you transmit? Oh, just, uh, just the one pulse in each direction. Okay, thank you.